aquaculture. And then we continue with Sharon, Sharon Ravitz Milgar, who has been teaching in ACAT for the last 15 years. Sharon will talk about her PhD research. Let's start with Hagi. Thank you very much. about biotechnology in aquaculture toward a sustainable food production system that will help to ensure food security. So we are living today in an era of great global, sorry, of great uh, global changes. The population of the world, this is the number of people and these are the years. So population of the world is growing increasingly at a more, more than 1.1% per year and it's expected to reach 9 billion people by the year of 2002. And of course, in order to care and feed all of from information from 1990 to 2010, we can see that Per capita change percent, that is per each one of us, there are less and less resources available. So there is less irrigated land, less cropland, less rangeland, and there are less forests. And it is expected to get even worse. Okay, so you can tell me, well, we are uh, indeed exploiting uh, the Earth's resources, but we still have water, as 70% of the world's surface is covered with water. So why don't we just go out to the sea and get ourselves food? So, is that really so? When again we look at population and availability of renewable sources, and we look at fish catch, we can see that over the years, per capita change for the percent, that is, again, for each one of us, there are less and less fish and seafood in general, less and less fish available. And uh, this is not only a, a problem that we don't get enough fish, we are actually imposing another uh, problem. We are inducing an ecological problem because what is happening is that due to extensive fishing, there is global loss of seafood species. So if by 1950, the number of the percent of species collapsing was zero, today we are standing at around 30% species at the danger of extinction and studies find that 90% of the ocean's edible species may be gone by the year 2048. So uh, what is uh, the next thing to do? And when we look at world fishing, this is a dark blue, so this is wild catch, world fishing stands today at around 90 million tons per year, and we have reached the limit. We are not able to go out and get any more fish, and it is expected even to drop down. However, fish consumption is on the rise. Everyone wants to eat more fish and seafood, and for a few reasons. One of them is that uh, fish are relatively cheap source of protein, Another one is that there is public awareness of the health that is attributed to fish being rich in omega-3. And also there is an increase in the buying power of Eastern economies. So um, we are, what is the future of fish? We have to move into aquaculture. And this is called the Blue Revolution, the promise of fish farming, and I'm quoting. 
If we are all going to survive and thrive in a crowded world, we need to cultivate the seed just as we do the land. And this is agriculture, it has been growing rapidly. It is actually the fastest growing food producing sector in the world. And uh, agriculture accounts today for about 50% of the world fish food producing for human consumption and it has a very high economic value. It is estimated at 150 billion US dollar per year. So uh, aquaculture is growing uh, worldwide and we partner in this uh, network that uh, promotes aquaculture. Also in Africa, we have the aquaculture network for Africa. It's relatively new. It was established in 2006. And here are uh, the uh, countries that are part of this network. But the main thing is that it's important to have networks. It is very important to share knowledge and information if we want to succeed. And soon I'm going to show you why it can be difficult to succeed. Okay, this is a big issue when you want to grow fish. fish you want to practice aquaculture, you must domesticate your organism. So uh, domestication of fish, especially of marine fish, uh, when we compare it to other livestock, so first of all, uh, the history of domestication of fish is relatively modern. It only started um, a couple of hundred years ago. Uh, and the number of species, there is a diversification. We're speaking of many, many number of species as compared to livestock. And uh, another issue is propagation or reproduction. And while uh, livestock is internal fertilization, fish, because of their high diversity, also use many different methods to reproduce. So this can be a quite an issue. So you're asking yourself, is it worthwhile? And what I want to show you now, then yes, it's worthwhile. Because when we're speaking of feed conversion rate, FCR, which means how much food, how much weight of food do I need to give my organism if I want it to grow? How many kilos of food do I need to feed my animal if I want to get one kilo of gross fish are the uh, most efficient organisms with FCR of one to one, that is for each kilo of food that I give my fish, invest in my fish, I will get one kilo of gross. And if I compare it to cow, for example, I need in a cow, I need to invest almost six kilo of food if I want to gain one kilo of gross. Fish are very, very efficient. So when we speak of domestication, we're speaking of closing the life cycle of that organism. We're speaking of reproduction. In the case of fish, we say spawning. We're speaking of larva rearing. We need to know how to grow the eggs, how uh, to put the fish are eating with omega-3. And then eventually, our final product, the fish will be rich in omega-3. So that is done by the use of biotechnology. So now uh, that we close the life cycle, I want to give one example for Israel, but especially for Israel. I want to speak about the gray mallet. Uh, so this is a fish. Uh, it's either male or female, very difficult to distinguish externally if it's a male or female. This fish reproduces in marine water, but then the little fish fingerlings go out to fresh water. This is where the fish is growing. In captivity, it does not reproduce. No way you can live it in captivity. Male, female, they will not reproduce. So fish farmers will have to go out and collect the little fish, the little fingerlings from nature. Here in Israel, and this is unique to Israel, we were able to solve the problem of reproduction by using biotechnology, hormone implants and injections, we got the fish to spawn, to reproduce. We are collecting the eggs. We are growing the young ones, uh, growing the eggs to larvae stage. And uh, then uh, 
we can supply, we're actually supplying fish farmers, farmers all over Israel with a fingerling of the gray mallet and we also, by using biotechnology, we know how to breed all year round. Okay? So this is something that is already achieved with biotechnology. The next goal that we are currently working on, and it's not achieved yet, it's under study, is to enhance the value of the fish that the fish growers are investing money in to grow. And well, how is that? Well, uh, in the gray market, we cannot distinguish between male and female just by looking at them. But females are the ones that are most desirable for agriculture because they grow faster, they get to be bigger. So we are trying to get to an all-female uh, stock. So one reason is because they grow bigger, but the other reason is that females have um, gonads, and those gonads, they are very much wanted in the market. So uh, for those two reasons, farmers would like to invest their money in growing fish that are female and not male. So this is where, again, biotechnology will help us hopefully to achieve this goal of all female stock. So uh, domestication and uh, biotechnology with the use of both of them, we are hoping that global seafood, seafood consumption in the future will reach two-thirds of it will be farm-raised and not wild-caught. And we hope that eventually farm-raised uh, fish and other seafood organisms will eventually take the place of wild catch. And with that, we can have sustainable food production and we can enhance food security. So thank you all for listening. Our original um, research was asking the question about sustainability. Can a desert food system be sustainable? And now we're referring to sustainability as something that can continue over time something that can survive and be productive all the time. The reason that we are worried about that, uh, as uh, Professor Hard already said and Dr. Quick also mentioned, are uh, diverse. We are living in a very, uh, very much changing world. First, increased population, according to the last uh, estimation of the United Nations, we're speaking about 9.8 billion people that we live here in the year 2050. And uh, we have to increase food production by 60, 70, 80, maybe even 90 percent if we want everybody to eat. Climate change is also a mega factor. It affects the agriculture sector directly, affects the production, the soil, the water, the humidity, and uh, also affects desertification. Global warming and human activity together are enhancing the desertification uh, process. You can see here, uh, in the red, those are the areas that are already defined as desert. In yellow, those are the areas who are vulnerable, okay? We are uh, expecting them to turn into desert at some point. And the green mount area, those are areas that are not vulnerable to desertification. So the desert is expanding. And right now, we already have 41, about 41% of the dry land defined as a arid area. Uh, arable land is reducing, as uh, Professor Mayohad also said. So uh, it makes sense that a lot of the future agriculture will have to take place in arid area. And this might be problematic. It's true that in the last uh, climate conference in Marrakesh in 2016, they said that actually arid agriculture might be the key to food security, but Every agriculture that doesn't sit well with the natural environment has a negative effect. Water, soil, human health, soil erosion, and so on. Also, because arid areas are not the optimal areas for agriculture, it makes sense to make the assumption that farmers here might need more inputs, more water, more energy, more fertilizer in order to keep the productivity. 
And if you use more inputs, you have a bigger environmental impact. That is a new set of problems because we have uh, customer demands. The modern customers today, they have a plan, they are aware, they know what they want, sometimes controversial. For example, the, the modern customer likes to have a fancy uh, packaging, luxury products for small households. We are used to have fresh supply of uh, fruits and vegetables from all over the world throughout the year, and then people will find it very hard to give up. Huh? On the other hand, customer demands, customers are much more aware about the environmental impact of the food they eat. And this is an example for the carbon footprint. You can see that in some countries, they already mark the carbon footprint. This is the amount of greenhouse gas that was released during the production of the product. The economically beneficial, and of course the scenarios have to be lower in it. So to a question, can a desert system be sustainable? Okay, we're still asking, but we think if it can adapt to the constantly evolving market or um, social condition, natural condition, economical condition, it can. It has to be in an effective and efficient way. Governing forms, public policy, production method, technology, and behavior. And last thing. When we speak about effective and efficient adaptation, it's not enough that the scenarios will be lower in impact or more economically uh, valuable. It has to sit well with the people, with the community, values and culture, uh, socially accepted. It has to be fair. It has to look fair. It's not enough that in my office I know I've been fair. People have to see this is fair. It has to be beneficial to all stockholders, not only to the people who implement it. And uh, this and more will ensure that there will be a successful implementation. Thank you. About Mashab and about Israeli uh, cooperation and collaboration around the world, I think what we what is very clear from, from the last two lectures is that anything <coughs> that we do we cannot um, stay on a business as usual basis because we are reaching a situation in a global on the global scene where by the year 2015 it was shown here very clearly by the year 2050 uh, this planet will most probably inhabit close to 10 million people and we will be lacking if we stay on business as usual basis we will be lacking 17 percent of the food that will be needed to feed these 10 million people and the only way that we humans can go about solving this challenge is by cooperating no country can do it alone no individual can do it alone no region can do it alone. And that is something very, very clear. That is something that has been clear to us in Israel almost since the establishment of this state 70 years ago. And this state was established in 1948 as a nation of refugees that came into this part of the world from Europe, from North Africa, from the Middle East, and from other parts of the world. And the experience that we had at the time of nation building, um, tribes, the north of Israel were Arabs and Jews living in very small communities, very uh, 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 primitive uh, social structures. And then, when the state of Israel was established, basically we established a country, we established a state out of scratch. There were no uh, state institutions. There was no uh, state infrastructures when the state of Israel was established. It's not that we inherited a country from someone and we built on that. And this experience of nation building out of scratch 
is something unique and unprecedented in modern history. We have similar examples maybe in the United States where the settlers came in from Europe and established uh, basically a state out of nothing in Australia, but we're talking about 200 and 300 years ago. And the only example in modern time, in the times that we're all living in, the only example of a country that was established out of scratch in this world. And this experience is something that appealed and is still appealing very much to many countries in the world. And in 1957, nine years after the establishment of the state of Israel, the prime minister and foreign minister at the time decided to establish an international development cooperation agency called Mashar in order to share the Israeli nation building experience with other nations in the world, especially in the main targets at the time were the evolving countries in Africa that themselves were unchaining from uh, foreign colonial uh, rulers and we wanted to bring to them our very, very current and pertinent experience of rapid development in nation building. And that's how the Israeli International Development uh, Program started, end of 1957. Sixty years down the line, we are still very much active in these very similar uh, attributions to fellow countries in the world, sharing the Israeli experience today we are sharing much more advanced development, high-tech, innovation, entrepreneurship, but still we are very much connected to the very basis of the establishment of Mashal, and that is uh, rapid development, although today it's more uh, innovative and sophisticated uh, development. Up until today, the State of Israel has cooperated with more than 140 countries. It's true that every developed country in the world today has a development agency like Mashab. We're actually one of the smallest being an agency of one of the smallest countries. But all OECD countries have development agencies, but they operate differently than the way we operate here in Israel. In Israel, we send our own experts from the Arava, from other regions in Israel. We send them to your countries to work with your people, with your professionals, with your agronomists, with your ministers and to directly share this uh, capacity building experience with, with your people. And that's the way Mashal uh, has been operating and that's the way we operate. Up until today, we've trained uh, more than 300,000 trainees from all over the developing world, more than 140 countries. Um, half of them have been trained in Israel and the other half have been trained uh, on the field abroad. One of the programs that Mashab is linked to is the program that we have here in, in Acre. It's true that it is implemented uh, very, in a very commendable manner, I have to admit, by uh, uh, ICAP, but we have uh, similar such uh, centers like ICAT all over Israel that are bringing students like yourselves for a period of 11 months. We believe that in time, the backbone of the agricultural sector of your countries will be based on students that have been trained in Israel through Israeli technology, uh, Israeli sophisticated agro-technology. Because as we saw before, the only way that our planet will be able to uh, uh, address the challenge of feeding 50, uh, 10 billion people by 2050 will be through sophisticated agro-technology. There's no other way that humanity will be able to face these great challenges. With aquaculture dwindling, with arable land uh, dwindling, with water dwindling, the only way is through technology. And Israel is sort of a, uh, a micro lab for such solutions. You know today, um, more than 60% of water that you um, uh, open a tap in Israel, the water that comes out of that tap, 60% comes from the Mediterranean Sea through uh, desalinated water. 
That is the future of uh, consumption water for households. There's no way that this planet will be able to quench the thirst of 10 billion people if we don't use seawater. In Israel, more than 80% of wastewater is recycled for agriculture. A lot of the water that reaches the southern deserts of Israel comes from recycled wastewater. Again, the only way that agriculture will be able to um, uh, maintain itself in the future will be by recycling wastewater into agricultural water. And all of these technologies, we hope that you are um, absorbing here in Israel and learning either uh, uh, through the uh, diploma program or through the um, uh, MA program uh, with the Tel Aviv University. And we have many such programs all across Israel, part of them uh, through Mashav, part of them through other agencies. And that is the idea that we're trying to uh, promote. I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, Fanny and her amazing uh, staff for all what they're doing. And uh, uh, it's true that most of the training is taking place here in Israel, here in the Arava, but I know they're now looking into uh, uh, taking projects outside of Israel, into your country, and we'll be very happy to be uh, partners with uh, uh, ICAC and bring the message from Arava. In many countries in the world, a desert is a burden. In Israel, we try to turn the desert into a resource, resource and um, we see in these greenhouses the products that are grown and are exported into Europe. And this can be done in every desert, in every single country in the world. I travel um, uh, through the developing uh, world quite extensively, and I meet communities in all countries. And today, it's very evident because the the uh, level of education is getting higher and higher. And it's very evident that all the communities know their needs. And they are very much aware of their challenges. And they might even know potentially how to address these challenges. But in many cases we encounter that that's where it stops. The gap between the knowledge of what we need to do in order to solve our challenges and the actual ability to implement. And that gap we in Israel are trying to uh, narrow down through cooperation. So please carry this message uh, back home and always remember that development has nothing to do with race, with color of skin, with gender. Anything that's been done here in Israel can be done anywhere in the world by any one of you and members of your communities and members of your government. So again, I want to thank all of you for coming to spend time here in Israel. And I want to thank our host for a very uh, wonderful program and a wonderful uh, agricultural fair here in the heart of uh, the Israeli desert. Thank you so much. In our country, inside our country, is a border, and Araba. All the things we learn by Araba, so we take the name Araba. Sorry for that. I want to just remember that is when we was here. Not only me, with me 165 students also, and my wife also here, that time, the big disaster in our country, the earthquake. I want to speak with you. My students and all the... I show you, I'm not the one now, because they... Sorry. Inside I can, the second day, Israeli organizations, they help us, they train us, not 
only train in, inside Israel. The idea of and doctors, they went nearby and rescue our family. All the media also they support us, the Israeli media. And we decided this is the first meeting during the earthquake time. We decided this today and we sitting at the tailor, the tactical tailor, and decided this is not disaster, this is opportunity for us to rebuild our country. So we decided we need to rebuild new Musab in Nepal. So we decided that time. And 14 April, maybe 4 April. 2016 in the Red Sea, the New Year time, our Nepali New Year time, where we went to Ilaq and start to collecting money, $2,000 per person. And we collect bond and we decided to establish Musab in Nepal. And 2016 June, we went back to Nepal, and the second day, not the, the first day we are sitting in our family, and second day we start our work. This one day, one photo, Maya also remember me, because she is also there. And we register our company, the government officer and rule, and we make instruction, we make And I need to give an uh, introduction our company. The Arba Nepal Modern Agriculture Company Limited is a public company. The first public company established with the efforts of 74 youth, 53 graduate students from ICAP, and 21 NRNA. NRNA means member who got agriculture skills from Israel in the very beginning. But this number is at 95. In the year of 2017, now we are, we are 95 percent, the shareholder. And how main target integrated agriculture, agricultural training, and agro-tourism also is a main free focus in our project. This is the shareholder location.